Hello, I'm Anna Raimondi coming to you from the Angel Cooperative in Ridgefield, Connecticut. Welcome to this episode of Talking to the Dead in Suburbia. Today, I'm so happy to welcome my guest and friend, Lori Gelman, to the show. Hi, Lori. Hi, so good to see you. Good to see you too. After 25 years as a TV broadcaster, Lori Gelman turned her talents toward writing. She has two bestsellers to her credit, Class Mom, and You've Been Volunteered, and a third coming this summer. Lori lives in New York City with her husband, Michael, and teenage daughters, Jamie and Misha. By the way, has the one that was coming this summer, is that, was that last summer that it was coming? No, it's coming out July 14th this summer. Oh, okay. Um, your books, I love your books. They're so funny. They're Thank just you so much. funny. Um, you know, and you know, having gone through that, the PTA mom type thing with my children, I read it and I laugh. You know, at one point I was the PTA president, which is- Oh, I'm so self. sorry. Oh my God. It was like the worst job I've ever had. That is they, and they used to yell at me for not like managing people. It's like, these are volunteers, guys. This is like not- I don't work for the school. Life. Right, me. right, <laughs> crazy stuff. Um, I'm just curious, how did you go from television to writing? Well, you know, I took uh, a few years off um, from television to raise my children. And um, what I really learned is that television waits for nobody. As you, if you get older, younger people are gonna scoot right in and, and take over, unless you're Barbara Walters or somebody like that. So I knew um, I needed to get back doing something after I'd spent so many years being the wind beneath everybody's wings, making sure they get off to school and to work okay and get everything done for them. And I loved that. That was the greatest time. And I feel like it was time well spent, but I needed an outlet. Once the girls were like late high school, I thought, gosh, I really gotta be doing something with my day besides going to Soul Cycle. You know, this is, I need to, I need some worth and I need to, a creative outlet. So I decided to write a children's book because I thought, well, that'll be easy because it, the crap that they put on, on television for people, or I'm not on television, and in, in books, kids' books are just, some of them are so stupid. I thought, I'll just write a quick one of those, make some money. And um, I was completely wrong. Uh, I got 47 rejections like that. And not one rejection was the same. Like I couldn't even gather what was wrong with the book based on the rejections because everybody disliked something else about it. And so I was like, wow, <laughs> that's the worst. Um, and I was out, I was out for lunch with my agent and, uh, he was giving me the bad news and I got a phone call. I was class mom at the time and I got a phone call and someone wanted to, you know, did I remember what their conference time was? And I'm like, yes, it's, it's right here, you know, along with the <laughs> million other things I've got in my head. I'm like, no, like it's in the email, look, check the email. And I hung up the phone and I was like, oh, these people. And so I started telling him some stories and he's like, that's your book. Cause forget the children's book. You got to write about this. So I didn't. Isn't that funny? Like, I mean, that's what things happen for a reason. You know, yeah. you had to put that first in book out there and try to get it published. It wasn't to be. And but you know, thinking, Anna, you were the first person to ever tell me that I was going to write a book. And it was, it was years later that I finally did it, but you were the first one. You said, you know, your great time is going to come when you write a book and you're going to write a book about that. That is going to be great for moms. I think was what you said. Oh, I still love it when I'm right. <laughs> So, right. You know, that's wonderful because um, I think that your, you know, your books are very widely read and they're, they're light, they're poignant, but there's messages in there, you know, about like yourself and who you are and what you're doing, you know, it, there's the undercurrent there and they're very funny, Thank very you. funny. So do you consider yourself to be funny? No. Oh my gosh. No. I mean, you could describe or ask other people to describe me and in 25 words and funny would never be one of them. It just, it was all going on in my head, but I never had the guts to say it. Like I would be out somewhere at, a, at, a, at I call it the cocktail party in my head because I'd be out somewhere and things would be happening and everyone's, you know, having a good time and things would come into my head and I would, I would think them, but I wouldn't say them. And finally, when I started writing, I just, all the thoughts that I wouldn't say came down on paper. And the first time I had anybody read it, they were like, oh my God, this is hysterical. I'm like, really? I couldn't believe I like I was I felt so lucky. Yeah, I think that's wonderful. Well, I'm glad you have that stuff come through your cocktail parties. I get more of I'll turn to my husband and say, that guy over there is having an affair. <laughs> you know that. Well, I'm kind of reading his energy, you know. I mean, 
I guess I could write a book about that. I don't know. What? Oh my gosh. That would be uh that would be different coming from the medium. Um, I I truly believe that laughter is healing. You know, I think that it's a part of who we are. Um, you know, it's the lightness. Um, do you bring laughter into your own life, you know, to heal or something like that where you know you just feel that you kind of let it go within laughter? Can I tell you it is one of the most healing things? And truth is in my car, my um, XM radio is set to number 94, which is um, a Netflix comedy. And it's just, you know, five minute snippets of, of stand up comedians, like just constant, you know, giving little riffs. And I love that. I love, I used to really listen to the news all the time and, and just thought, no, I can't. no that's not funny, funny anymore. And, I, and now I just laugh. And there's really some funny people out there. And that to me, it puts me in a better mood. And I've always admired people who are funny too. I think that's always attracted me to, to people in the past, friends and, and lovers and husbands and stuff. Do you think Michael's funny? He's very funny. In a dry way, he doesn't get to show it a lot, but he's really funny and extremely quick. Yeah, I think that's, that's wonderful. So what is your new book called? It's called Yoga Pant Nation. It is number three in the series of Jen Dixon, our fearless hero, who was a class mom. And then in the second book, she was in charge of safety patrol. And in this third book, she's in charge of the school's fundraiser. So we oh. all know these are all the worst jobs. Worst job. <laughs> Although PTA president, I would not even touch that in a book. Yeah, that wasn't good. <laughs> no. But I did my stint. I did it. I thought I was going to be able to be closer to my kids. Little did I know has nothing to do with my children. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I did it. I started out wanting to be a class mom because the first year I was in kindergarten, there was this class mom and she's like, she was like a goddess, you know, she had older kids and she'd been there before and she knew everybody. And I was like, oh my God, I want to be her. I want to be this popular girl that walks up to when you pick up your kids and every mom wants to scurry over and talk to them. I had no idea what they were talking to her about. And it's like the stupid stuff, like when's my conference time? And are we going to have the milk and cloth? You know, just right. all the stuff that, well, what you know. color are the tablecloths? Like <laughs> whatever color you like. You know, and that's not what people are going to be focused on. But, you know, I think it gives a, when people are going through that phase of their life, it gives them a place, you know, yeah, um, and everybody needs their place. So there is something really wonderful about it. You know, I mean, I had just moved to Connecticut when I got involved in every single thing, like everything. Like yeah. I, I had stopped working and I was involved in everything. And then I picked and choose what I wanted. Um, it was it was like redefining who I was, which was really it's interesting. Like getting older, you know, it's yeah. like you getting you, older too. You, you start out, you know, with everything and then you sort of uh, um, cut back a lot. But there are a lot of frustrated uh, heads of companies who taken time off to have yeah. kids who all converge at one time on a school. So there's a lot of type A's, you know. Yeah, there's a lot of them. Top yeah, top. And, you know, that's what makes the world goes go around. So how did you write a book during a pandemic? Like you were in quarantine with your families and you were able to write a book? I know. Well, here's the thing. I, I promised to write the book and then quarantine hit or the COVID hit. So I hadn't really started the book and I knew I had a deadline. You know, the first book's so easy because nobody cares if you're going to finish it or not. You know, I, I didn't sell it to anybody before, you know. It's like nobody cared that Lori Gelman was writing a book. This time around, I had a deadline. I had, and writing funny stuff during COVID was not easy at all. I mean, it was really a tough time because as I said, we were in Florida. Uh, that's where we had to shelter in place because we were on spring break and then we couldn't get back to New York. And it just, it wasn't the right um, circumstance to be writing a hilarious book about Jen Dixon being the, you know, leader of the, uh, the class uh, of the school fundraiser rather. So I, I, I think I, t I went to sort of a dark side and um, a lot of my humor was not like ha, 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 humor. It was like, oh, you know, and I, my editor had to sort of take me back to the lightness, but I put it all out there and then, you know, she sent it back and she's like, by the end, she was just writing, God, no, you're not allowed to say this. <laughs> this is wrong. I'm like, okay. But I had the shell there of a good story. So I, I in the rewriting, the magic is always in the rewriting, as you know. So many people during, you know, this pandemic on quarantine have been like so deeply looking at themselves and are all writing, they're all writing books, 
You know, everybody's writing a book. Everybody I talk to is writing a book, you know? Um, and I keep telling people whether the, the book comes out for other people to read or you just have it for yourself, it's so cathartic. It's so, it's so healing that, you know, there's so much of whoever writes a book, there's so much of the author in the book. And when you read the book, you realize, hmm, yeah, like that's a piece of me I want to change or, um, or address or whatever, or that's me. I haven't looked at that piece of me yet. Do you see yourself in the books? Oh, well, the first book is almost completely me. I mean, the emails that Jen Dixon writes to her class are verbatim. I took them from my class emails, those snarky, like I'm in charge, response times will be noted, like all the stuff that I put in the book. I, I actually did that. And um, that was very funny. It was extremely <laughs> cathartic. I have to say it was like I was I was taking names and taking no prisoners. You know, I was like, oh, I remember when she did this. Uh -huh. And then I would go and write a whole chapter on it or whatever. Um, but I, I always encourage, especially women, to write a book. I always say, if you think you want to, you have to mm -hmm. do yourself a favor and sit down and write it. And don't think about writing and don't say, oh, I can't write it. Just sit down, carve out time for yourself every day and write that book because typing the end is the cake. That's the cake. The cherry is getting people to read it. And the, or no, excuse me, the icing is getting people to read it and the cherry is getting it published. So like the yeah. cake though is the book and you'd be so proud of yourself just typing those two words at the end. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, so you're a mom, you have children. Uh, how has having kids changed your perspective on your spirituality or the world or what's around you? Well, I mean, I think when we first have kids, especially when I first had um, a daughter, every horrible, awful, terrible thing that I could imagine would, would happen to her would pop into my head. I mean, it was a daily dose of like, oh my gosh, what if, what if I drop her at the store? What if somebody snatches her out of the, like, every day, all day was like the worst things that could happen. And, and that really got me to a dark place. So I, I, I realized for the second one, I had to sort of um, trust the universe that this baby was gonna be okay, that the, the universe was gonna take care of her even if I wasn't there for five minutes, you know, that, that uh, things were gonna be okay for her. Because otherwise you drive yourself nuts. It, yeah, it never stops. It's the first time you let them take a cab by themselves in, you know, I live in New York City. So mm -hmm. the first time you're just, you're just on pins and needles and, and it's like, call me when you get there and you track them on your phone if you can. I mean, we didn't have that technology even six years ago. So my kids were doing all these things, you know, without me being able to be right there with them. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I learned early on that I had to just surrender my children to the universe, to God, because I couldn't control them. They weren't always with me. And then in the suburbs, they're driving you know, and there's, you know, you can, I know people who just like, like they can't even sit still once their kids get their license because, oh my God, they're not very good at this. They're going to get in an accident. I mean, very calmly, okay, God, you got them, protect them and really let that. it go that way. I think that our children bring us into a deeper part of our soul and who we are. Um, you know, I'm sure as fathers, but speaking as a mother, you know, that too. And as mothers, we love to nurture, you know, it, it's part of who we are, you know, and then they leave. Okay. No one, no one prepares you for the punch in the boob that is your child leaving the nest and not needing you anymore. You really, it was, it was, it took my breath away when I had to drop my daughter at college. It, it, it was the hardest thing I've ever done. I mean, I kept the ugly cry away until I was away from her, but we got in the car to go back to the hotel and I just like, it was just bawling my eyes out and it hurts, it physically hurts to well, not you know where they are at every minute because that's your whole life is, you know where they are, you know exactly what they're doing, you're in yeah. charge of most of it, you know? And, and they're sleeping in your house, you know, they're your babies, they're in your nest. Yes. You know, when we brought my older one to school, so we brought my older one to school. I still had a young one home. My kids are six and a half years apart. And so we bring Matthew to school and there's nothing for us to do. We have to go. My husband would not leave. We were there for like five days. Oh no. And this is at the University of Pennsylvania. And you know, I'm in Connecticut. No. So it's not like he was in California. You know, <laughs> he would not leave. You know, I mean, you know, 
love expresses in different ways and it's part of and you grieve them you know like you grieve the baby you grieve that part of motherhood you know um and then you move in you move on with your life because that's what you got to do you got to cope with all of this and you know you do get used to living without them yes you do you know what i mean you get used to their absence and my older daughter just has such a, a huge presence in our, our family. She laughs a lot and she, she talks and she's smart and she engages in all kinds of things. And she left quite a hole when she went away. But just as we were getting used to her being gone, COVID hit and she had to come home. <laughs> so yeah. all of a sudden it was like she was back for, you know, it's um, funny. like a bonus year that we didn't expect to get with her. Yeah, and it really was, wasn't it? I mean, in a lot, I mean, I was very fortunate this year because I was an empty nester. I had one child working and living in Queens, the other one living in Manhattan. COVID hit and I got my two sons back and the fiance. Uh, so we went from <laughs> two to five, okay? Yeah, um, I loved having them there. My house will never be the same. Um, loved having them there but the cooking was unbelievable. Yeah, for all of us, like that was the worst thing that there was no opportunity to say, oh, we'll just order in tonight. Right. It was, you know, I cooked for six every night of COVID that we were in Florida. Oh. We had my husband's parents there as well. And, and I don't know how it fell on me, but it did. For some reason, even if I wasn't going to actually do all the cooking, I had to do all the planning. I had to make sure everything, because everybody would look to me around, you know, two o'clock in the afternoon and be like, what's for dinner? I know. I know. And I'd be like, I don't know. And then we couldn't really, we really weren't ordering in, in the beginning. No. So I was, and we couldn't get food. So right. I'm getting orders of meat. We don't eat meat. And my kids are like, but we don't eat meat. Just eat it. Cause I can't get chicken. You know, like, and you guys don't like, like pasta. So like, what are we going to do here? So, you know, but you know, I, I, I think that this was, I, I don't know. Like I thank God every day that we were able in my family to have the blessings of being together. I got to really know my future daughter-in-law. I got to reacquaint myself with my sons and, you know, and to really look at what's going on and what we really need now. Like we don't need all that other stuff. I don't, I mean, I may like nice things and, you know, handbags or this or that, but like, really? Like yeah. I, I sat back and said, where am I going? And when am I going? You know right. what I mean? Like I'm here with them in my pajamas, right. you know? So, you know, that's kind of what it was. That's kind of what it was about. Yeah. Well, we were the lucky ones. Let's face it. There were a lot of people lucky who ones. didn't have any, um, oh my gosh, the things that people went through. I just, just horrible. I know right. it's horrible. But so yeah. are you guys still meditating? Do you guys last, I mean, I saw you, well, I don't think the last time, but the time before that, um, it was a whole meditation thing. Are yeah, you guys, you guys um, I still meditate. My husband meditates. I'm not sure the girls do. I think that they have to come to that on their own. So um, do you meditate when you're writing? Like before you like write a chapter, do you meditate like to connect to your so-called muse or do you just write? That's funny because I have such a routine for building up to sitting down in front of the computer, which is, you know, the greatest, you just, the last thing you want to do is sit down because it's lonely and it's hard and it's time consuming, but you know, so I, I do a whole thing to ramp myself up, but meditating would actually be a good idea now that I think about it. I usually meditate before bed to sort of before calm bed. myself. Yeah. yeah. That's to a different myself. kind of meditation though. Yeah. That kind of takes you out of the, the stress of the day. Mm -hmm. um, but if you use the other meditation, like when I write, you know, depending on what I'm writing, like when I wrote conversations with Mary, obviously I'm, I'm listening to her, but the yeah. other things I have written, like I, I do meditate. Um, and I kind of, and then it flows easier. It just tends, it quiets everything else in my mind. I bring in my angels and whoever else and, and they help me. And it's, um, I don't know, it's pretty wonderful because I, I don't feel alone when I'm writing. So you oh my God, I always feel so alone. <laughs> so I'm going to try that. I'm going to actually give that a go. I've, I'm starting the fourth book. Um, because, because dozens of people have demanded <laughs> another book from me. So um, I'm going to, I'm starting the fourth book, uh, probably in February. So I will try that. So are you going to write a book about the empty nester? What it's like when, um, maybe and right now everybody wants this one character, Jen Dixon and the fourth book, she's, um, he's, he's only in seventh grade. So like he, we're going slowly up the ladder. 
Uh, at some point, yeah, I'm sure I will, but I really want to write a, something else about somebody else. So I'm not really, you know, excited to keep the Jen Dixon thing going past this fourth book that I still have to write. Oh, you probably will though. Well, you know, shake the money maker, as my husband would say. Yeah, but you know what? I also think it's 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 giving a lot of healing to a lot of people out there who think they're all alone in that place. You know, um, and it's more than misery likes company. I, I don't think that's what it is. It's that everybody, everybody feels different. Like, why am I the only one who thinks this? When, you know, there's this group think where we probably all think the same thing. I've had so many great, so much great feedback like that. And when I've done my book tours, women love to come up to me and like, they're just like, can I tell you my story? Can I tell you what happened to me? And I'm like, and as long as you don't mind seeing it in a book, because I may steal it. I'm running out of ideas on my own. And they're always like, of course, of course. And uh, they have some amazing, funny, interesting, uh, horrifying stories to tell. Yeah, well, I don't know. That's where the humor comes in because, you know, in retrospect, it's like, that's really funny. You know, <laughs> really funny. Like somebody actually had that conversation, yeah. you know, um, because we're just human, you know? Um, and so, I don't know, like I can listen over and over again to Robin Williams, you know, his Carnegie Hall, you know, video. I think it's a riot, but now when I listen to it, I hear something else, oh, really? you know? Yeah, I do. I hear something else there. Um, he's still hysterical, you know, like, you know, do you want fries? You know, that kind of the whole routine. I don't think I've ever seen that routine. Oh, it's really, it's, you gotta watch it. He's very, he's, um, he's it's heartwarming. Um, but then, you know, I guess when I watch it now, I do feel something else, but, you know, um, he was able to bring that to a stage and have us laugh, this you know, so and who knew, you mm -hmm. know, you know, and that's why I think, you know, now people are looking to laugh, you know, I think, you know, the whole true crime that was such a big deal on television, you know, last year and the year before is moving away for some more light lightness, you know, we want lightness. So, right. um, well, that's a good thing that has come out of all of this. Yeah. So can I um, ask you a question? Sure. That has nothing to do with this. Um, who's Audrey? I have no idea. Um, there's an Audrey here. Okay. Um, I feel like there's an Audrey and there's a woman named Isabel or Belle or Bella. Well, I have two aunts who are dead that were named Audrey and Isabel. Okay. Because they're, they're in the room with you. Okay, um, they're, they're giving you strength. I don't think that they had this in them, okay? And in between them is a man, okay? Um, and he has his hands on your shoulders, okay? Um, and he's saying that his biggest claim to fame were the road trips or going somewhere where there was a lake with everybody because everybody could read. Like he loves that you're in the Hamptons, okay? In a place where there's water and you can relax, okay? Where you can just be yourself. He's very happy because that's what he liked to do. Yeah. Um, the way he's behind you, he feels like he would be a father figure. Is yeah, this your father? Um, he's laughing because he's saying so many girls, so many females, so many females, so many, like, I feel like he's, there are men, but he's, he's always surrounded by in some way women. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, daughters and I have two, and then his okay. grandchildren are mostly girls. So. Always surrounded by women. Um, and he's saying that his greatest lessons in life were from the women. I don't know if he would, he's very gentle like very soft and even, yeah. very soft and even. Um, he probably would have admitted this in life. You know, I don't think he would have had a problem. Um, he still feels like, you know, he's a manly man. He wants to be a man. He wants to be known as a manly man. Um, mm -hmm. But he's saying my blessings, my blessings. I'm still counting my blessings. He wants you to know he had a really good life and he was ready to go. Oh. Really good, really good life. Is your mother in Florida? No, she's dead. She's passed. Oh, so she passed. She, did she pass after him? Uh, two weeks after him. I feel like okay. it was a grudge match between them. Like, okay. Like, did, he pass, did she pass in Florida? No. Okay, because he's showing me Florida. Okay. So were they in Canada or Florida? They were in Canada, both of them, but um, not together. They hadn't been together in 40 years. Okay, so they were in separate places in mm -hmm. Canada. So who had the place in Florida? 
My father. Well, actually, they both did at one point. They both did at one point. Okay, because he's talking about the happiness in oh, Florida. Florida. He used to call it his place in the sun. He the happiness in Florida. Florida. Yeah. yeah, I don't feel her as much as I feel him. Okay, I mean, I see in the I'm seeing the letter of her name, but um, I don't feel her as as I feel him. I feel him much stronger. That's not to say she's not around you. Okay. Um, I think that, did she talk a lot, your mother? Not, not that you would say, oh boy, does she ever talk a lot. She was a good conversationalist. Because I feel like she's stepping back to let him do the talking. Because they're at peace with each other, okay? Yeah. They're at peace. Her name begins with an A? No, a B. Okay, <laughs> what's her name? Barbara. Okay, who's, who's Anne or Anna? Oh my gosh, Anna's my stepmother. Okay, and where is she? For over 40 years. Okay, and where is she? She is passed as well. Okay, um, okay, so I am seeing not your mother, I am seeing your stepmother. Okay, that, I mean, I think your mother's there, but your stepmother is there too. She wants you to know she loves you, okay? Um, and she, th she knows how hard it was, okay? She's saying it was up and down and up and down, but um, it's all okay now. Um, your father comes to you in your dreams all the time. Have you been seeing him? Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. really him. So it's not like it's a psychological thing where you're trying to work out something, you know, there's the psychological dreams and then there's the spiritual dreams and the spiritual dreams tend to be more colorful, okay? Where you really feel like you're with the person. Um, and his, it's his gentle touch that you can feel in the dream, okay? Um, and he wants you to know that he's just, he's with you and he's protecting your daughter. You know, when she goes off to school again, he's with her. He's with completely. her. Completely. You don't have to worry about okay. it. Anna, that was so nice of you to tell me that, that you have no idea. That's, you know, I, I, you're right. I am much more connected with my father, even in death than my mother. And um, he was the greatest guy. I, I could, everything you said was exactly right. He, the, the one thing he um, had Alzheimer's. So for the, the last eight years of his life, he didn't know who I was. And then he stopped talking. I mean, you couldn't have a conversation with him. So in my dreams, he comes back and just hearing his voice and yeah. he's talking to me is so, it gives me so much strength. I wake up in the morning and I feel so much better. Good. Because he wants you, that's what he wants. He wants to take away that pain from those years where he couldn't speak to you. Yeah. That's why he's doing it now. And he really has his hands on your shoulders. Like he's looking over to kind of like, I'm going to, I'm going to help you. I'm going to supervise you. You should never feel alone when you're writing. Never, ever, ever. He'll be right there. You know, and he's saying, I don't, I don't feel like he wrote a book or anything like that. You know, he worked doing whatever he was doing. There's lots of papers around him, but I don't think he's, doesn't feel like he's writing a book. He has great stories. He could write a book um, and you could take his stories and write a book and make them into a novel. He's saying, if that's what you want to do, he's okay <laughs> with that. Um, but, you know, um, he's saying, but I, I help you. I, I help you organize. Like he's organizing your energy in some way. So you're never alone. I love that. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. I, I hope I, I was okay. I, I don't know. I, I feel like you gave me so much more than I just gave you. It was like, no, it's wonderful. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. And I'm just so thrilled to be speaking with you. I love your books. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, people will, who haven't read them will also love reading them and laughter is a healer. So, you know, you don't have to always be reading something so intense, you know, sometimes we just need to read something light and funny. I mean, I do, you know, especially during the pandemic, like I don't need anything heavy duty. I want to read something that's going to lighten me and make me laugh. And you're providing that for people. So you're helping them heal. And, and we all appreciate that. So thank you um i hope you all enjoyed today's episode if so please like share and comment and be sure to subscribe to our channel so you never miss an episode thank you laurie thank you anna